Thus passed our days, in a tense monotony interrupted by a brief rest in the souls. But even at the position there was sometimes a good hour. Often, in a peaceful sense of the security of my shelter, I would sit at the table of a small dugout, whose rough, boarded, weapon-laden walls gave off a Wild West vibe, drinking tea, smoking, and reading, while the orderly tended the tiny stove, which filled the room with the smell of dried bread. What foxhole soldier is not familiar with such moments? Outside, the heavy, measured footsteps of the guard could be heard, and a monotonous call was heard when the sentries had to reconcile in the trench. My dulled hearing can hardly distinguish the never-ceasing rifle fire, the short blows of bullets hitting the shelters, or the flares hissing and disappearing at the base of the light pole. Then I would pull out my notebook from my clipboard and briefly jot down the day's events. Thus, in time, a kind of chronicle of sight see appeared in my diary, a small, rugged piece of the front line where we settled, familiar to us, to every abandoned trench, to every ruined dugout. Here the bodies of fallen comrades rested beneath hills made of clay, here on every inch of ground a drama was played out, behind every bunker a fate was waiting, day and night snatching its victim indiscriminately. And yet we all felt that we belonged to our plot, that we were fused with it. We knew it, stretching like a black ribbon across the snow-covered landscape, soaked at midday with the intoxicating odours of the floral riot raining around, or shrouded in the ghostly light of the full moon penetrating to the darkest corners, in which squeaking gangs of rats led their secret life. Cheerful, we sat on its earthen piles on long summer evenings, and the warm air carried to the enemy the business-like clatter or songs of the motherland we threw ourselves over the rubble. Chopped down the barriers, as death hammered the trenches with its steel club and smoke crawled sluggishly out of the ruined earthen walls. More than once the colonel was about to send us to a quieter part of the position, and each time the company as one man asked permission to remain at Station C. I give here a short extract from my observations recorded on those nights at Monchies. October 7, 1915. Was standing on patrol at our dugout with a squad sentry when a bullet moved his cap from his forehead to the back of his head without hitting his head. One of them was hit in both legs by a ricocheted bullet, the other was shot in the ear. A little later, a sentry on the left flank was shot through both cheekbones. Blood was gushing from the wound. To top off the misfortune, Lieutenant von Ewald also came to our section today to take the end dig, which was only fifty metres from the trench. As he turned to go down to our posts again, a shot to the back of his head blew his skull open. He died instantly. At the bottom of the trench lay the pieces of his skull. Then another was lightly wounded in the shoulder. October 19th. A section of the middle platoon was pelted with six-inch shells. One was hurled by an air wave against a trench-bracing pile. He sustained severe internal injuries, besides having an artery in his arm severed by shrapnel. Eight in the morning fog, while mending a wire fence on the right flank, we discovered the corpse of a Frenchman of a month old. During the night, two of our men pulling the wire were wounded. Gutschmidt was shot through both arms and also the top of the thigh, Schaefer through the knee. October 30th. During the night, owing to a downpour, the whole line of the berm collapsed and mixed with the water into a viscous mush, turning the trench into a deep quagmire. The only consolation was that the British were no better off we watched them scooping the water out of their trenches, and as we stood higher up, the excess of our moisture rolled down on them as well. We put our sniper rifles into action. The collapsed walls of the trench revealed a number of corpses from the fighting of the previous fall. It's November 9th was standing with Landsturm and Wiegmann in front of Fort Altenburg when a bullet that flew in pierced his bayonet hanging over his shoulder and severely wounded him in the pelvic bone. English bullets, with their easily split ends, act as bursting bullets. Otherwise, being in this small earthen fortification lost among the landscape, where I stand with my part of the platoon, affords more freedom of movement than on the front line. From the front we are covered by a small hill, behind us the terrain rises to the Aidenfer Forest. Fifty metres behind the fortification is our marching latrine, which from the point of view of tactics is not particularly well located. It is a wide bar lying on two goats, like a rooster's roost, with a long hole underneath. A soldier likes to nestle here thoroughly, either reading a newspaper or, in the manner of canaries, establishing a common roost. From here all those vague odours known everywhere under the name of latrine spirit waft along the front. 
but the coziness here is largely disturbed by the fact that the place, though not in view, is liable to be hit by indirect fire reaching here across the flat hill. When its summit is heavily shelled, the bullets fly across the hollow at breast level, and it is only by spreading out on the ground that one can be safe. It happens that during the same sitting more than once one has to throw oneself on the ground more or less clothed, missing above oneself a machine gun line similar to a gamma, which of course is cause for all sorts of jokes. Other kinds of variety offered by this post include hunting for all sorts of wildlife, especially grouse, in great numbers inhabiting the empty fields. In the absence of hunting rifles we have to sneak up very close to the candidates for roast and shoot their heads off with a bullet, which, however, greatly reduces the amount of meat for the pot. However, we have to be careful not to stick out of the hollow in the heat of pursuit, which instantly turns the hunter into a game that receives its portion of live fire from the trenches. The rats we exterminate with powerful traps. The animals, however, are so strong that with a great noise they try to free themselves from the metal. Then we rush out of the dugouts, bruising them with a club. We have invented a kind of hunting even for mice that have come to eat our bread it consists in putting a gutted cartridge with a paper bullet in the rifle. And finally, with one non-commissioned officer we invented another extremely exciting, but not entirely safe sport shooting, namely during the fog we collect unexploded large and small shells, some up to a centner in weight, which are in abundance throughout the area. Having arranged them at a distance, like pins in a row, and hiding behind an embrasure, we open fire, and we do not need a man to check the target, for a hit a blow on the fuse instantly reveals itself by a terrifying rumble, still many times amplified if the whole nine is hit when one after another the shells of the whole series explode. November 14th. At night I dreamed that a bullet had pierced my arm. During the day therefore kept expecting something of the kind. Nov. 21. Was leading a party of diggers from Fort Altenburg to Section C, when Landsturm and Diner climbed up on the ledge of the trench wall to throw earth over the slab. Barely had he appeared at the top when a shot rattled from the undercut and shot through his skull, and Diner fell dead to the bottom of the trench. He was married and had four children. His comrades waited long afterward at the embrasures to repay blood for blood. They wept angry tears. The Englishman who fired the fatal shot seemed to be their personal enemy. November 24th. One man of a machine gun company was severely wounded in the head on our section. Another of our company was scratched on the cheek by an infantryman's shot half an hour later. November 29th. Our battalion moved for 14 days to Kiantu, a town lying on the division stage, to engage in exercises and to indulge in the pleasures of real life. During our stay there I learned of my promotion to lieutenant and transfer to the second company, where I had many happy and bitter days. In Kanta and the neighbouring towns the local commandants often called us to their drunken revels, and we had an opportunity to look at the almost unlimited power with which these princes ruled over their subordinates and inhabitants. Our captain called himself King of Kienth, and appeared every evening, greeted by the raising of his right hand, and a resounding long live the king. At the table, where he ruled as capricious monarch until dawn, any transgression against etiquette and its highly convoluted statutes was punishable by an extra beer. We front-line soldiers, of course, as novices passed out very quickly. The next day the Rotmister would appear in the afternoon still slightly foggy, to drive in a two-horse carriage through his domains and pay visits to the neighbouring kings making abundant sacrifices to Bacchus, and thus preparing himself decently for the evening. This was called making a raid one day he started a quarrel with the king of Inshi, and sent a mounted gendarme, to announce the beginning of the strife. After some fighting, during which the two squads of stable boys even exchanged fire with clods of earth from small, wire-fortified trenches, the King of Inchi was so careless that he allowed himself to be carried away with Bavarian beer in Count's dining room, and was caught and captured when he visited the place of retreat. He had to pay off with a ton of beer. Thus ended the feud between the two rulers. On December 11th, I went from the rear to the front line to introduce myself to Lieutenant Vettier, commander of my new company, occupying alternately with the old 6th Company Section C. As I was about to jump into the trench, I was startled by the changes which had taken place in the position during our 14 days' absence. It opened into a huge, one-foot-deep sludge-filled puddle, in which the train led a drearily splashing existence. 
drowning up to my thighs, I sadly recalled the round table at King Kent's. Poor us frontline pigs. Almost all the dugouts collapsed, all the adits were flooded. In the weeks that followed we had to work non-stop to get at least some ground under our feet. In the meantime I, together with Lieutenants Vettia and Boyer, lived in an adit, from the vault of which, in spite of the tarpaulin, flowed like a watering can, so that the orderlies had to carry water up in buckets every half hour. When the next morning, drenched through and through, I came out of the adit, I could not believe my eyes. The area, which had hitherto borne the stamp of mortal desolation, had assumed a fair appearance. The soldiers of both sides had climbed out of the horrible slurry onto the berms, and already in the space between the wire fences there was a lively exchange of schnapps, cigarettes, uniform buttons and other things. The mass of khaki-clad figures, hitherto only occasionally showing themselves from the English trenches, was overwhelming like a ghostly vision in the midst of a clear day. Suddenly a shot rang out and one of our men fell dead in the mud, whereupon both parties, like moles, disappeared into their trenches. I went to the part of our position opposite the English undercroft and shouted that I wished to speak to an officer. Several of the Englishmen did leave and soon brought a young man from the commander's trench, distinguished, as far as I could distinguish through binoculars, by a more intricate cap. We negotiated first in English, then more fluently in French, the soldiers around us listening attentively. I reproached the officer for the perfidy with which our man had been killed, to which he replied that the shot had been fired not from his, but from a neighbouring company. Ilo ao kochons orsi chesvi said, and just at this time bullets sent from the station next to us flew quite close to his head, which I promptly acted upon by disappearing into cover. But we talked for a long time in what might be called sportsmanlike politeness, and at the conclusion we might well have exchanged a keepsake. To set the record straight, we solemnly declared the continuation of the war at the expiration of three minutes from the end of the negotiations, and after his guten Abend and my au revoir. I, in spite of the regret of my men, fired a volley at the barrage behind which the Englishman was sheltering, followed immediately by a return blow which nearly knocked my rifle out of my hands. For the first time the situation enabled me to view the space in front of the dugout, for usually in this dangerous place no one ventured to stick out even the edge of his cap. I noticed a French skeleton lying just beside our wire, the white bones of which glimmered beneath the rags of a blue uniform. By the cockades of the English caps we ascertained that the Hindustan Leicestershire Regiment was opposed to us. Immediately after these negotiations our artillery fired several volleys at the enemy's position, after which four stretchers were carried across the lane before our eyes to my joy there was no further volley from our side at that moment. During the war one always endeavoured to treat the enemy without hatred, and to estimate him according to his courage. My task was to pursue the enemy in battle to kill, and from him I expected nothing different. But I never thought of him with contempt. When prisoners were subsequently taken to us, I always considered myself responsible for their safety and tried to do what I could for them. The weather became more and more unpleasant towards Christmas we had to install pumps in the trenches to control the water. Thus, in my diary of December 12th, I find today we buried seven of our men in the souls, and two more were killed again from December 23rd filth, and abomination consumed everything. This morning a powerful shell exploded with a rumble and whistle at the entrance to my dugout. I had to put three men, with difficulty scooping out the water that rushed into the dugout. Our trench was hopelessly flooded, Tina up to the belly, a sense of despair. A dead man appeared on the right flank, so far only feet are visible. Christmas evening we spent in position. Standing in the liquid mud, the men sang Christmas songs, drowned out by the English machine guns. On Christmas Day we lost one man from 3rd Platoon he was hit in the head in a firefight. The English soon made an attempt at a friendly rapprochement by putting up a Christmas tree on the berm, which, however, our exasperated men swept away with a few shots, to which the Tommies promptly replied. So Christmas passed rather uncomfortably. On December 28th I was again commandant of Fort Altenburg on that day one of my best men, Rifleman on, had his arm torn off by a shell fragment. Another, heat-eating, was badly wounded in the thigh by one of the many stray bullets that were sniffing around our low-lying earthen fortification. And also my faithful August Kettler, the first of many of my troopers, on his way to Monchi, whence he was going to bring me food, fell a victim to shrapnel which strewed him on the ground with a punctured windpipe. 
As he was leaving with the cauldron, I said, August, see that you don't get wounded on the road, not at all. Herr Lieutenant, and so I was called. And I saw him wheezing on the ground right in front of my dugout. With every breath he drew air into his chest through the wound in his neck. I ordered him to be taken away. August died a few months later in the infirmary. In this, as in many other cases, the most painful thing was the feeling that the wounded man could not speak and only looked at those around him with the helpless eyes of a hunted animal. The road from Monkey to Fort Altenburg cost us blood in general. It ran down the back slope along a slight crease in the terrain, lying 500 metres from our front line. The enemy, probably on the basis of aerial photographs, regarded the road as an active one and considered it his duty to sweep it with machine guns or pelt it with shrapnel. And although there was a trench nearby and we were strictly and strictly ordered to use it only, everyone was dragging along the road with the usual indifference of experienced soldiers, without any cover. As a rule, they got away with it, but one or two victims were taken every day, which amounted to a sizable figure. And here at the latrine, errant bullets flew in from all sides, so that it was necessary, not quite dressed and waving a newspaper, to take cover in a clear field. Nevertheless, the indispensable structure continued to stand indestructibly in the same place. January, too, was a month of hard work. Each squad dug, bucketed and pumped to get rid of the liquid mud near its dugout and, having found solid ground beneath its feet, tried to establish communication with its neighbours. In the Ardenfer forest, where our artillery was stationed, teams of woodcutters were clearing young trees from their limbs and splitting them into long logs. The walls of the trench were hewn and lined with wooden shields. Numerous drains, ditches and catchments were also arranged, and we soon regained tolerable living conditions. The catchments were particularly effective, with clay covers to channel the water, distributing the flow over the hygroscopic chalk layer. On January 28, 1916, one man in my platoon was wounded by a piece of shrapnel from a bullet that crashed through a barrier shield. On the 30th, another was shot in the thigh. When we were relieved on February 1st, there was a crushing fire on all the nearby roads. Shrapnel fell at the feet of the gunner Junge, a former plasterer from my former 6th company, but it did not explode, but burst into a long tongue of flame, as from a burner Junge was carried away with severe burns. In the same days a non-commissioned officer from the 6th, whose brother had died shortly before, was mortally wounded by a mine he had found he unscrewed the fuse and noticing that the greenish powder he had shaken out was all burnt, stuck a smouldering cigarette into the hole. The mine, of course, exploded, wounding him fifty times. In one way or another, we suffered minute-by-minute minute casualties due to the carelessness that resulted from incessant intercourse with explosive materials. An inconvenient neighbour in this respect was Lieutenant Pocock, who had taken up residence in a lonely dugout in the tangle of trenches behind the left flank. He had dragged a pile of huge unexploded shells into it and amused himself by unscrewing the fuses, then dismantling them into small parts like clockwork. Whenever I passed this ominous abode, I dispersed the large number of spectators surrounding it. Often people would knock out the brass guide ring of a shell to convert it into a bracelet or a paper knife, and then something of the kind would happen too. On the night of February 3rd, after a strenuous stay in position, we were back at Dushi. The next morning I was sitting in a blissful sense of impending peace in my apartment on Emmickplatz, enjoying my coffee, when suddenly a monstrous shell explosion the signal for general shelling sounded just outside my door, hurling the window frame into the room. In an instant I was in the cellar, where all the other occupants of the house had already rushed in with astonishing speed, presenting a most pitiful spectacle. As the cellar was half built above ground and separated from the garden by a thin wall, Everyone was huddled together in the narrow short passage to the bomb shelter, which had only been under construction a couple of days before. Squeezing through the pressed bodies into a dark corner, driven by animal instinct, was my sheepdog. In the distance, a series of gunshots was heard from the same place, followed thirty seconds later by the whistle and howl of approaching heavy shells, cut short by the rumble of an explosion near our cabin. An air wave blew through the cellar windows, Clods of earth and splinters drummed on the tiled roof, and the horses in the stable snorted and thumped their hooves. In addition, the dog whined and the fat musician shrieked loudly, as if he were about to have a tooth extracted, when he heard the approaching whistle. At last the inclement weather was over and we could go outside. 
the ravaged village street came to life like a disturbed anthill. My apartment looked dishevelled. Right by the cellar wall the ground had been ploughed over in several places, the garden trees were broken, and an unexploded shell lay mockingly in the middle of the gatepost. The roof was all pierced through. A strong explosion had cut off half of the chimney. Nearby in the company office an apt shrapnel penetrated the walls and a large closet, riddling the officers' uniforms, stored there until the vacation home. On February 8th, heavy fire fell on Precinct C. Early in the morning an unexploded shell from our artillery fell into the dugout of my section on the right flank, as an unpleasant surprise to its occupants, pushing through the door and overturning the stove. This so fortunate incident was depicted in a cartoon in which eight men above the smoking stove were shown pinned down by the broken door, while in the corner the unexploded shell grinned maliciously. Then in the afternoon three more dugouts were shelled fortunately one man was lightly wounded in the knee, for all but the postmen had gathered in the adit. The next day Rifleman Hartman of my platoon was mortally wounded in the side by the fire of a flanking battery. On February 25th one death made a special impression on us, which plucked an excellent comrade from our ranks. Shortly before shift change I received a report in my dugout that a volunteer carg had just been killed in a neighbouring adit. I went there and saw, as I often did, the men of the unit standing by the motionless body lying on the blood-soaked snow with its hands cramped and its glassy eyes staring into the dusky winter sky another victim of the battery on the flank. When the firing began carg was in the trench and immediately jumped into the adit. The shell exploded so unluckily at the edge of the trench that a large fragment was thrown into a completely closed passage into the adit. Karg, who thought he was already safe, was hit in the back of the head it was a quick, sudden death. The flanking battery in general was in full force that day. About once an hour it gave a single terrifying volley, and the trench was chalked with shrapnel. In the six days from February 3rd to February 8th it cost us three deaths, three seriously and four lightly wounded. Although the battery must have stood at most a mile and a half away on the mountainside on our left flank, our artillery was unable to silence it. We tried increasing the number and height of the protective crossbars, thus limiting the effectiveness of the shells to as small a portion of the trench as possible. We camouflaged places viewed from a height with hay or rags. We even reinforced the posts with beams or slabs of reinforced concrete. The increased movement in the trenches was enough to encourage the tactics of the British, who wanted to nail the enemy here and there without, without much ammunition. With the beginning of March all this nastiness was behind us. It became dry and the trench was cleanly boarded up. Every evening I sat in the dugout at my little table and read or chatted if anyone was visiting. Along with the company commander there were four of us officers and we lived very friendly. Every day we drank coffee in the dugout at one or the other or had dinner often with a couple of bottles, smoked, played cards and had soldierly conversations. Here I also learned that herring with jacket potatoes and melted fat was an unrivalled meal. These cosy hours in the dugout balanced in my memory other days full of blood, dirt and labour. They were only possible during this long, relatively quiet period at the position where we had settled down and acquired almost peaceful habits. Our special pride was our building activity, and we were engaged in it without any compulsion. Working without rest, we dug one after another thirty-stage adits in the clay chalky clay and connected them with cross galleries so that we could easily get six metres underground from the right to the left wing of our platoon. My favourite child was a sixty-metre passage from my dugout to the commanders, from which to the right and left, as from the underground lobby, departed storage and living compartments. This construction was appreciated in subsequent battles. When, after morning coffee, we even had newspapers coming to us almost regularly freshly washed, with inch ruler in hand, we would meet in the trench, we would compare the achievements of our plots, touching in conversation on the frames for the tunnels, types of dugouts, timing of work, uh, and the like. A favourite subject of discussion was the construction of my alcove, a small sleeping place that was to be carved in dry chalk, and would overlook an underground corridor, a sort of foxhole, where one could sleep through the very end of the world. For a mattress I had a thin wire mesh saved, and I was going to line the walls with a special cloth from sandbags. On March 1st, when I and the militiaman Eekman and I were standing behind the tarpaulin, a shot rang out very close by the shrapnel flew past us without hitting us. Looking closer, we found that several pieces of iron, hideously sharp and long, had cut through the tarpaulin. 
people called these objects ratchet or buckshot, for they were nothing but a swarm of splinters which suddenly began to whistle around. On March 14th, a direct hit from a six-inch shell in the neighboring section on the right killed three men and severely wounded three others. One of the dead disappeared without a trace, the other was badly burned. On the 18th, a shrapnel hit a sentry at my dugout, tearing his cheek and severing his earlobe. On the 19th, on the left flank, Rifleman Schmidt was severely wounded by a shot in the head. On the 23rd, on the right of my dugout, Rifleman Lohman was killed by a shot to the head. That same evening, a sentry informed me that there was an enemy patrol at the wire fence. With a few men, I crawled out of the trench, but found nothing. On April 7th, on the right flank, Rifleman Kramer was wounded by a bullet fragment in the head. Wounds of this kind, owing to the British bullets flying apart at the slightest collision, were very frequent. In the afternoon, the vicinity of my dugout was pelted with heavy shells for several hours. The light well was piled up, and at every burst a hail of hard clay flew into the hole, which, however, did not prevent us from drinking coffee. Then we had a duel with an insanely brave Englishman, whose head was visible over the edge of the trench at most a hundred yards away. He pummeled us with his incredibly accurate embrasure targeting shots. I returned fire with several men. However, one accurately aimed bullet struck the edge of our embrasure, splashing sand in my eyes and a splinter in my neck. We, however, did not give a hoot either we stuck our heads out, aimed briefly, and then disappeared again. Then came a shot on the rifle of Storch, whose face, hit by at least a dozen splinters, was bleeding. The next shot tore a piece from the edge of our embrasure. Then another shattered the mirror into which we were watching. But we were satisfied when our adversary, after several shots precisely placed on a clay ledge near his face, disappeared without a trace. At the last, with three shots, I swept away the barrier over the embankment, from whence this desperate fellow always appeared. On April 9th, two British pilots flew over our positions several times. The whole formation rushed out of their dugouts and furiously fired into the air. As soon as I said to Lieutenant Sievers, just so long as the flanking battery doesn't wake up, at once iron shards whistled at our ears, and we jumped into the nearest adit. Sievers was standing at the entrance I advised him to pass on, and one. A palm-sized piece of shrapnel, still smoking, landed at his feet on the damp clay. In addition we received several more shrapnel shells, the black balls of which burst over our heads with great force. One man was wounded in the shoulder by a pinhead shrapnel, which however hurt him quite badly. For this I threw some pineapples, that is, five pound mines resembling the shape of this exquisite fruit into the trench. As if by tacit agreement, the parties limited themselves to firearms, while the use of explosives was returned to the enemy a hundredfold. Unfortunately, the enemy had enough bullets to keep a long breath in a firefight. After this horror, we drank several bottles of red wine in Siva's dugout, which so cheered me up that, in spite of the bright moonlight, I returned to my lodgings over the top. I soon lost my direction, fell into a shell crater, and heard the voices of the English working in their trench. After disturbing their peace with a couple of grenades, I quickly disappeared into my trench, running my hand over the protruding spike of one of our glorious traps. They consisted of four iron blades, one of which I had fallen on. We used to set them on rat trails. In general, there was a lot of activity at the wire fences these days, not without its share of dark humour. Thus, one of our patrolmen was shot by his own men he stuttered and could not pronounce the password at once. Another, after celebrating until midnight in the kitchen at Monchi, climbed over the fence and opened fire against his own line. When he fired back, he was dragged inside the trench and duly beaten. In the middle of April, 1916, I was detached to Croisil, a township behind the front line, for a course of instruction under the personal supervision of Major General Zontag, the division commander. These were theoretical and practical training in a number of military disciplines. Particularly exciting were tactical horse rides, which were led by Major von Jarotsky, frequent sorties and inspections of earthworks in the rear wee, accustomed to disdainful look at everything lying behind the front line, gave an idea of the immense work done behind the back of the fighting troops. We visited a slaughterhouse, provision stores and gun shop at Boisel, a sawmill, a sapper park in the Borlon Forest, a dairy, pig farm and soap factory at Inchi, an airplane park and bakery at Counter.
On Sundays we travel to the nearby towns of Cambra, Duet and Valenciennes to look at women in hats again. It would not be very good of me if in this book, where there is so much blood, I were to be silent about a little adventure in which I played a rather comic part. One winter day, when our battalion was on a visit to King Keant, I was appointed for the first time as a young officer to check the posts. Getting lost in a new place, I went into a tiny lonely house to find out how to get to a small post near the station. The only occupant was a 17-year-old girl named Jian. Her father had recently died, and she was running the place alone. In answer to my question, Jean laughed and said, Visites bien June, J. Vaudry avoir votre devenir. Because of the bellicose tone in which these words were said, I gave her the name of Joan of Arc and more than once then, during the trench fighting, mentally returned to the lonely house. One evening at Croisil, I felt a sudden desire to ride there. I ordered my horse to be saddled, and the town was soon behind me. It was a May evening, as if it had been designed for such a ride. The clover was a heavy burgundy carpet in the meadows fringed with flowering blackthorns, and at the entrance to the village the giant candelabra of flowering chestnuts glowed in the twilight. I drove through Bolcourt and Ecus, not suspecting that two years later, amidst a completely changed landscape, I would be compelled to storm the ominous ruins of the villages that evening lying so peacefully surrounded by ponds and hills. At the little station I was checking out at the time, residents were unloading gas cylinders. I said hello and watched them for a while. Soon a familiar little house with a roof splattered with red-brown round patches of moss appeared in front of me. I knocked on the closed shutters. Quiet, lay. Bonsoir, Jean D'A.R.C. Ah, bonsoir, mon petit officier Gibraltar. I was welcomed as kindly as I had expected. Tying up my horse, I went in. I had to share my dinner eggs, white bread and butter which looked very appetising on a leaf of cabbage. In such circumstances one does not wait for an invitation, one goes straight into action. Everything would have been fine if then, when I went out into the street, a flashlight did not flash before me and a field gendarme did not ask for my papers. My conversation with the inhabitants, the attention with which I looked at the gas cylinders, my unexplained appearance in this loosely troop-occupied neighbourhood, all this aroused the suspicion of espionage, Naturally, I forgot my soldier's book and had to be taken to the King of Kenth, who, as usual, sat at the head of the feast. The King knew a great deal about such adventures. My identity was verified. I was invited to join the company. This time, the King appeared in a different light. It was late. He talked about the virgin tropical forests where he had long been in charge of the construction of the railroad. On June 16th we were again released by the general to the troops with a short address, from which we understood that a major enemy offensive was being prepared on the Western Front, the left flank of which would be approximately opposite our position. It was the Battle of the Somme, and its shadow was already upon us. It was to be the end of this first and easiest phase of the war. Now it was as if we were entering a new war. All that we had hitherto experienced, without realising it, was an attempt to win the war by outdated field fighting and the failure of that attempt in position warfare. We were now facing a battle involving technology with its colossal reserves. By the end of 1917 it had in turn been replaced by a systematic technical war, the image of which was as yet unclear. That something was being carried in the air became clear on my return to the regiment when comrades told of growing uneasiness on the station. The British had sent out, but without success, a strong patrol against Section C. After an artillery preparation, we replied by raiding three officers' patrols on the so-called Trench Triangle, taking a number of prisoners. While I was away, Lieutenant Vecchi was wounded in the arm by a shrapnel bullet, but shortly after my arrival, he again assumed command of the company. My dugout was also changed. Because of the hit, it became half as large. During the aforementioned patrol, the British had thrown hand grenades at it. My deputy managed to squeeze through the light well to the outside, but his trooper was killed. Blood spatters were still visible in large brown stains on the planks of the planking. On June 20th I was instructed to eavesdrop at the enemy trench to see if the enemy was engaged in mine sweeping at midnight. Together with Fenric Walgemuth, Sergeant Schmidt, and the rifleman Partenfelder, I climbed over our rather high wire fence. Bending down, we passed the first section and crawled along the densely overgrown supply lane. 
Childhood memories from Carl May came to my mind as I slid on my belly through the dewy grass and through the thistle thickets, careful to avoid all noise, for out of the gloom fifty yards ahead the English trenches protruded in a dark line. The fire of a distant machine gun fell almost plumb upon us, at times a flare soared into the sky and cast its cold light upon the uncomfortable ground. Suddenly a heavy rustling sounded behind us, two shadows flashed toward the trenches. While we were preparing to rush, they disappeared without a trace. The rumble of hand grenades in the British trenches made it clear that it was our men who had crossed our path. We crawled slowly onward. Suddenly Fenric's hand squeezed my arm attention to the right, very close, quiet, quiet. Following that I heard to our right, about ten metres away, a measured noise in the grass. With sudden distinctness, as is often the case at such moments, I realised our position. We had been moving all along the English barriers the enemy had heard us and had come out of the trenches to survey the neutral strip. These moments of night reconnaissance are unforgettable. Vision and hearing are sharpened to the limit. The approaching noise of strangers' footsteps in the tall grass acquires an incredible, almost fatal force. It captures the whole. My breathing becomes ragged, and I have to suppress the urge to cough. With a short metallic click, the safety of the pistol bounced, a sound that struck a nerve. Teeth grind on the cord of a hand grenade's fuse. The clash will be brief and deadly. A shudder grips you under the influence of two powerful feelings, the growing excitement of the hunter and the fear of his victim. The entire world is filled with you, devastated by the dark sense of terror looming over the desolate terrain. A few vague figures loomed just ahead of us. There was a whisper. We turned our heads toward them. I heard the Bavarian Partenfelder bite the blade of his dagger. They approached us a few paces and started working at the wire without noticing us. We slowly crawled far back, keeping our eyes on them. Death, who had been standing impatiently waiting between the two groups of men, withdrew, displeased. After a while we got up and went on until we arrived safely at our station. The success of our outing encouraged us to the extent that we decided to go out again the next evening to procure a prisoner. I rested all the afternoon until the rumble of an explosion near my dugout made me jump up. The British had fired a shell, which though it made little noise when it was launched, was so heavy that the fragments of it had sheared off piles of planking as thick as wood. Cursing everything, I got off my coucher and went to the trench, but when I saw the black ball of shell flying in an arc, I disappeared into the nearest adit with a cry of shell on the left. In the coming weeks we were treated with shells of all sorts and sizes so generously that we had already developed the habit of looking into the air with one eye walking along the trench, and with the other eye at the entrance to the nearest adit. At night with three companions I again crawled near the trenches. We were moving in a groping position close to the English fortifications, hiding behind separate tufts of grass. After a while several Englishmen appeared, pulling a coil of wire. They stopped just in front of us, set the coil down, flicking scissors around it and talking in whispers. We slid closer like snakes, quickly exchanged words no louder than an exhalation. First a grenade and take one, there's four of them, they'll all get clobbered, shut up, sheesh, but it was too late when I looked again. The English had slipped like lizards under their wire and disappeared into the trench. The mood had gone down. The thought that they were about to bring a machine gun into position made my mouth water. The others feared the same. To the noise and clanking of the guns we crawled back on our stomachs. The English trenches were lively. A bustle. A flurry. A rapid whispering. Pish. A flare. It was as bright as day we tried to hide our heads in tufts of grass. Another flare. Painful waiting. I wanted to fall through the ground, or better yet, to be anywhere else but ten metres from the enemy posts. Another missile. Peng. Peng. The familiar sharp deafening sound of several rifle shots fired at close range. Aye, hey, we've been discovered. Counting for nothing. Bracing ourselves with a loud shout, we risked a run for our lives, jumped up and dashed under the fire, splashing in all directions toward our position. After a few jumps I stumbled and fell into a small, almost flat grenade crater as the other three, who thought I was finished, rushed past. I pressed myself into the ground pulled my head up to my knees, and let the bullets fly over me in the tall grass. The pieces of smouldering magnesium from the falling flares, which sometimes burned very close to me, were also unpleasant, and I waved them away with my cap. At last the firing subsided, 
and after a quarter of an hour I left my shelter, moving first slowly, then as fast as my legs would carry me. As the month had meanwhile set in, I could no longer see anything, and knew where either the English or the German side was. Even the characteristic ruins of the mill at Monchi were no longer visible on the horizon. At times bullets whizzed over the ground on one side or the other with frightening sharpness. Finally I lay down in the grass and decided to wait for dawn. Suddenly I heard a whisper very close by. I prepared myself for battle again, and like a cautious man, made a few natural sounds, from which it was difficult to distinguish whether I was German or English. At the first call in English I decided to reply with a grenade. To my joy it turned out that in front of me were my men, who had already unbuckled their belts to pick up my corpse. For a while we sat together in the funnel and rejoiced at our happy rendezvous. Then we went to our trenches, which we reached after an absence of three hours. At five o'clock in the morning I was already on trench duty. At the section of the first platoon in front of his dugout stood Field Feet X. When I was surprised to see him at such an early hour, he told me that he was looking out for a large rat, depriving him of sleep at night with his fiddling. At this he was looking around his ridiculously small dugout, which he christened Villa Leberecht Hunchen. Standing near each other, we heard a muffled shot, which this time announced nothing dangerous. The day before, X had almost been killed by a large shell, and so frightened, he rushed to the entrance of the nearest adit, rode on his ass down the first fifteen steps, and on the last fifteen he tumbled over his head three times. Standing at the entrance, I laughed and forgot about shells and tunnels as I heard the poor victim lamenting his unsuccessful rat hunt, rubbing his body in various places, and trying to set his dislocated finger. The unfortunate man told me that he had been dining yesterday when he was startled by the shell. All his food had gone to hell, and besides he had already had a very sensible fall down the stairs yesterday. After this amusing incident I went to my dugout, but I never had a cosy nap. In the morning our trench was bombarded with shells at increasingly short intervals. By lunchtime something unbelievable had begun. I set up our mortar and took aim at the enemy trenches. However, it was a rather weak response to the heavy shells with which we were literally vaporised. Drenching ourselves with sweat, we squatted on the clay of a small trench depression, heated by the hot June sun, and sent mine after mine to the enemy. As even this did not tame the British, Vettier and I went to the loudspeaker, and after some deliberation sent the following cry for help Granny is spitting into our trench. Big clots. We need potatoes, large and small. This was the gibberish we used when we feared we would be overheard by the enemy. Immediately a consoling reply came from the senior lieutenant that a fat mustachioed Vakmistrov, accompanied by several small boys, would arrive at once, and immediately our heavy, two-centimetre shell, supported several times by a barrage of rapid fire from the field artillery, rumbled into the enemy's trench with an unheard of rumble, so that we spent the rest of the day in peace. But the next day the dance got even tighter. As the firing started down my underground corridor I went to the second trench, and from there to the trench where our mortar was set up. We opened fire, answering each booby trap with a mine. After we had exchanged about forty shells, the enemy gunner seemed to be aiming specifically at us. The shells came from right and left of us, which however did not prevent us from labouring on, until one of them came straight at us. At the last moment we grabbed the firing cord and rushed away as fast as we could. Just as I flew into the muddy, wire-covered trench, the monster burst right behind me. A powerful air wave tossed me through the barbed wire and into the greenish sludge-filled crater. A hail of hard clods of clay drummed against me. Half stunned, unable to tell which way to go, I stood up. My pants and boots were torn with barbed wire. My face, hands and uniform were thickly smeared with clay. My knee was bleeding with a long abrasion. With difficulty I dragged myself through the trenches to my dugout to rest. The enemy shells, however, had not done much damage. The trench had been destroyed in several places, the loud-mouthed mortar had been demolished, and the Villa Leberecht Hunchen had been finally destroyed by a direct hit. Its unfortunate owner was already down in the adit, otherwise he would have had to topple a third time under such circumstances. All through the afternoon the firing continued without interruption, turning into a hurricane fire by evening because of the innumerable cylindrical shells. These roller-shaped shells were called laundry basket shells. By hours, for it sometimes seemed as if someone was shaking baskets of them out of the sky. 
You can best visualize them if you think of a rolling pin with two short handles for making noodles. They were fired from special, revolver-like mills, and they floundered in the air with a clumsy rustling sound, looking like smoked sausages from afar. They came so densely that their ground burst resembled an igniting rocket charge. And while landfills were more destructive, these ones were more on the nerves. In tense anticipation, we sat at the entrance to the adits, ready with weapons and grenades to meet any alien. But after half an hour, the fire began to subside. During the night, there were two more fire raids, during which our posts invariably kept watch to stand watch. As soon as the fire subsided, numerous rockets soared upward highlighting the defenders popping out of the galleries, and the frenzied fire convinced the enemy that there was still life in our trenches. In spite of the frenzy of fire, we lost only one man, the rifleman Dersman, who had his skull crushed when a shell struck his shield. Another was wounded in the back. And during the day which succeeded that restless night, numerous whirlwinds of fire prepared us for a close attack. Our trench was shot through from time to time and made almost impassable by the chipped wood of the planking. Some of the dugouts were also blocked up. The commander of the subplot sent a message to the front line intercepted telephone conversation of the British. They accurately described the gaps in our wire barriers and call for a steel helmet. Whether this word means heavy shells is not yet known. Be ready. So for the coming night, we decided to be alert at all times and agreed to shoot anyone who did not give his name at the call of hello each officer, loaded his rocket launcher with one red rocket to let the artillery know at once. The night was indeed even more stormy than the previous night. The fire raid at two. Fifteen in particular surpassed all previous ones. A hail of heavy shells around my dugout. In full armour, we stood on the stairs to the adit. The light of small cigarette burners reflected flickeringly in the wet mouldy walls. Blue smoke crept in through the entrance. Earth crumbled from the ceiling. Boom. Damn it, match. Match Gatovsi, my heart was pounding at my throat. Hands, disobeying, released the grenade's primer. That's the last one. Go as we rushed for the exit. Another projectile with a deterrent ignition fell. We were hurled backwards by the airwave. Nevertheless, though the last iron birds were still descending with great noise, all the posts were already occupied by the crew. A flurry of rockets lighted up the neutral strip veiled by a thick canopy of smoke as if it were daylight. There was something mysterious in these moments. When the whole train stood behind the barrier in the highest tension, they reminded me of that breathtaking second after the raised curtain, when suddenly the music stops and the whole stage is flooded with light. I spent several hours of that night leaning against the entrance of my dugout, facing the enemy line, and glancing at my watch to make notes of the shelling. I watched the postman, a man of years, the father of a family, occasionally illuminated by the sparks of bursts, standing perfectly still above me at his gun. When the fire subsided, we suffered another loss. Nienhuser, the gunner, suddenly fell from his place at the post and rolled down the stairs of the adit with a clatter at the feet of his comrades, who were standing at the ready below. Examining the ghastly alien, they found a small wound on his forehead and a bleeding hole above his right nipple. It remained unclear whether the wound or the precipitous fall was the cause of death. Toward the end of that terrible night, we were replaced by the sixth company. In that peculiar state of depression which dawn brings after a sleepless night, we marched along the lines of trenches to Monchi, and thence to the second position on the outskirts of the Aidenfer Forest, which offered to our eyes a broad view of the beginning of the Battle of the Somme. The sections of the front to our left were shrouded in white and black smoke, towers of heavy shells, and hundreds of lightning bolts of bursting shrapnel glittering above them. Only the mottled rockets a mute call to the artillery for help gave away that there was still life in the positions. For the first time I saw fire comparable only to the elements of nature. When I finally managed to get some sleep that evening, we were ordered to load heavy shells into Monchi and waited in vain all night for some stranded transport, while the British, with their heavy machine gun fire and shrapnel scouring the streets, fortunately without success, were made attempts on our lives. I was especially angry with the great machine gunner, who was fanning so high into the air that the bullets were falling downwards even faster under the force of gravity. So there was no point in taking cover somewhere behind a wall. This night the enemy gave us an example of all the thoroughness with which he conducted his observation. In the second position, about 2,000 yards from the enemy, a mountain of chalk had grown in front of one warehouse adit, which had not yet been arranged. 
The British drew the unfortunately correct conclusion from this this heap should have been camouflaged at night and fired shrapnel at it, severely wounding three men. In the morning my sleep was again frightened away by the order to lead the platoon to Section C for Shantung work. My units were inside the 6th Company. I took several men to the Adenfer Forest to occupy them there chopping trees. On the way back to the position I went into my dugout to sleep for half an hour but in vain. That day I would not see any rest. As soon as I pulled off my boots I heard our artillery firing from the Adenfer Forest. Immediately at the entrance to the trench my servant pole-like appeared and shouted down gas attack. I grabbed my gas mask, slipped into my boots, buckled my belt, rushed outside and saw there a gigantic, dense, whitish fog hanging over Monchi, a cloud of gas, which, driven by a weak wind, was rolling toward point 124, which had been destroyed to the ground. Since my platoon was mostly on the front lines, and an attack was highly likely, there was no time for reflection. Leaping over the obstacles of the second position, I rushed forward and soon found myself in a gas cloud. The stinging odour of chlorine instantly convinced me that it was not a smoke screen, as I had first thought, but indeed a strong war gas. I put on my gas mask but immediately tore it off, for I was running fast and short of air. In addition, the glass fogged up and became completely opaque. All this did not correspond much to the gas attack exercises which I myself used to conduct quite often. Since I could already feel the pounding in my chest, I tried at least to cross the cloud as quickly as possible. On the outskirts of the village I still had to break through a line of barrage, the bursts of which, guided by numerous clouds of shrapnel, formed a long, evenly spaced chain over the desolate, long-neglected fields. Artillery fire in such open ground, where one can move about freely, acts both physically and mentally quite differently from that in a populated area or position. So I instantly left the firing line behind me and found myself in Monchi, which was under a frenzied shrapnel fire. A shower of bullets, burnt-out shells and fuses hissed on the limbs of fruit trees in feral orchards and drummed on the walls of houses. In one of the dugouts dug in the gardens I found my company comrades Sievers and Vogel they had built a fire, and were leaning against the purifying flames to get rid of the effects of the chlorine. I took part in their occupation until the fire burned out, and then moved toward our outposts along trench number six. As I made my way along, I saw the small animals, killed by the chlorine, lying in abundance at the bottom of the trench, and thought, the barrage is about to begin, and if you keep dragging along like this you will sit here without cover like mice in a trap. Nevertheless I relied on my incorrigible calmness. Indeed, it happened that only fifty yards from the company dugout I came under a new and even more severe fire attack, in which it seemed quite impossible to get through this short stretch of trench unscathed. Fortunately, I saw one of those niches which were dug in the walls of the trenches for the liaison men. Three frames from the adit not much, but still better than nothing. I huddled in the niche and waited out the inclement weather. I think I found the tiniest nook. Light and heavy shells, Molotov cocktails, shrapnel, rattlesnakes, grenades of all sorts I could no longer tell what was buzzing, banging, and rattling. I remembered the simple-minded corporal in the woods near Leslie Parges and his cry of horror, my God. What on earth are those things? At times my ears were completely deafened amidst the general, fiery, infernal rumbling. The incessant hissing made it seem as if hundreds of heavy shells were rushing after each other at an incredible speed. Then, with a short, heavy thud, an unexploded shell fell, so that the ground around them shook. The shrapnel burst by the dozens, as gently as a clapper, releasing its bullets in a dense cloud, and the spent shells fell with a hissing hiss in their wake. If a shell struck nearby, debris would rain down on me from above, and the shrapnel would whistle into the ground. But still it was easier to describe the sound than to bear, for every single sound of passing iron was associated with the thought of death, so I squatted in my hole with my hand over my eyes and went over in my mind all the possible kinds of hits. I think I found a comparison that quite accurately captured the feeling of the situation which I found myself in quite often, like every soldier in this war. You have to imagine yourself firmly tied to a pole, and that someone, swinging a heavy hammer, keeps threatening you. The hammer then moves away in a swing, then whistles in front of you, almost touching your skull, then strikes the pole so that splinters fly this corresponds to the feeling experienced by someone who is out of cover in the middle of heavy shelling. 
Fortunately, an underlying feeling, as it happens during the game, told me everything will be okay, which is soothing, even if there is no good reason for it. So ended this shelling too, and I continued on my way, hurrying even more. In the front line, the men were busy. According to their much practiced gas attack behavior in oiling their rifles, the muzzles of which were completely blackened by the gas. Fenric sadly showed me his new harness, which had lost its silvery luster and had turned greenish black. As everything was quiet at the enemy's place, I withdrew again with my units. At Monchi we saw many gas-stricken men, sitting in front of the infirmary they had their hands clasped at their sides, moaning and gasping, their eyes watering. All this was not at all harmless. Some of them died a few days later in terrible agony. We had to endure a gas attack of pure chlorine, a poisonous substance that corrodes and burns the lungs. From that day on I resolved never to go out without a gas mask. Hitherto, with indescribable levity, I had often left it in the dugout, using the case as a sandwich bag. On the way back I stopped to buy something in the mess hall of the 2nd Battalion and saw a distraught little fellow there in the midst of a pile of broken goods. A shell had pierced the ceiling, flown into the commissary, and turned its treasures into a marvellous mishmash of jam, leaped canned goods, and green soap. With pure Prussian thoroughness, the owner billed the losses to the amount of 82 marks 58 pfennigs. In the evening my platoon, which had hitherto been in the second position, on account of the uncertainty of the fighting situation, was pulled up to the village, being given the mine as a place of stay. In the numerous recesses we set up a sort of camp and lit a gigantic fire, leading the smoke down the well shaft to the great anger of the company cooks, who were panting upstairs as they pulled their buckets of water. Having concocted an excellent grog, we sat around the fire on the chalk slab, singing, drinking and smoking. About midnight an infernal spectacle broke out on the battle arc at Monchi dozens of signal bells rang, hundreds of guns fired, and green and white rockets soared ceaselessly upward. Then began our barrage, heavy shells rumbling, leaving plumes of fiery sparks behind them. Everywhere, where a single living soul dwelt in the heap of ruins, a long shout was heard gas attack. Gas. Georgia Ayers. Gar Az. In the light of the rockets, a blinding stream of gas rolled over the black, jagged silhouettes of the walls. The strong smell of chlorine was also felt in the mine, so we lit large bundles of straw at the entrance, the acrid smoke of which drove us out of our shelter and forced us to wave overcoats and pieces of tarpaulin to clear the air. The next morning we examined with amazement the traces left by the gas. Most of the plants had wilted, dead moles and snails lay everywhere, and the horses housed at Monchi were being rubbed with tearful eyes and slobbery muzzles by a mounted liaison. Bullets and shrapnel scattered everywhere were covered with a noble green patina. In Dushi itself, the traces of the cloud were even more visible. The affected residents gathered in front of Colonel von Oppen's dwelling and demanded gas masks. They were put on trucks and sent to the rear settlements. All the next night we spent in the mine in the evening the order came that at four. Fifteen we were to get coffee, as an English defector reported that at five o'clock the attack would begin. Indeed scarcely had the men on duty who had returned from coffee disturbed our sleep, when the now familiar gas attack was heard again outside. A sweet-smelling odour hung in the air, this time we were being rewarded with phosgene. A hurricane fire raged on the Monchi line, soon, however, subsided. This turbulent hour was followed by a refreshing morning. Lieutenant Brecht came out of trench number six into the village street with his hand on a bloody bandage, and with him walked a man with a bayonet fixed and an English prisoner. Brecht was received in triumph at Western headquarters and told as follows. At five o'clock the British let off gas and smoke from their cylinders and followed it up by bombarding the trench heavily with shells. As usual our men jumped out of their hiding places while still under fire, losing more than thirty men in the process. Then two reinforced British patrols appeared hidden behind a smoke screen, one of which penetrated the trench and took a wounded non-commissioned officer with it. The other patrol was swatted down still at the wire fences. The only Englishman who overcame the obstacle, Brecht, who before the war had been a planter in America, grabbed him by the waist and with the words come here, you son of a bitch, took him into his arms. This single man received a glass of wine and looked half frightened and half amazed at the newly empty village street, now swarming with food carriers, orderlies, liaisons and rotisseurs. He was a tall, 
very young fellow with golden hair and a fresh, childish face. What a misfortune it is to have to kill guys like this, I thought as I looked at him. Soon a long train of stretchers gathered outside the dressing station. Many wounded had arrived from the south of Monchi, for the enemy had briefly succeeded in making a breakthrough in Company Section E. One of those who broke through must have been a desperate fellow. Unnoticed, he jumped into the trench and raced along it behind the backs of the sentries watching the terrain ahead. He took turns pouncing from behind on the sentries, who were restricted in their field of vision because of their gas masks, and after stunning some of them with the blows of his rifle butt, he returned to the English line unnoticed. When the trenches were being cleaned up, eight men were found with the backs of their heads crushed. Some fifty stretchers, on which lay moaning men in bloody bandages, were placed in front of several fluted tin sheds, where a doctor with rolled-up sleeves did his work. A young lad, whose syrupy lips stood out in bad foreshadowing on his snow-white face, was babbling, I'm heavy, I never any more, I have to die, the fat, non-commissioned officer, looked at him, and from time to time muttered consolingly, well, well, buddy. The next day we finally returned to our favourite village again for a few days. That same evening we celebrated the successful outcome of this little action with a few well-deserved bottles of wine. On July 1st we were given the sad duty of burying some of our dead in the churchyard. Thirty-nine wooden coffins, on the unplanked boards of which the names were written in pencil, were lowered into the grave. The priest began by saying, You are Gibraltarians and truly stood like a rock in a raging sea, and at the end added they fought gloriously. It was only in these days that I really learned to appreciate the men with whom I was to fight together for two more years. I am referring to the British action, hardly even mentioned in the army reports we had to deal with it in the area, generally not intended for a major attack. As a matter of fact, each time the troops were required to take only a few steps, namely to overcome the short stretch separating the posts from the entrances to the Adit. But these steps had to be taken at the moment of the climax of the fire, which precedes the attack and which one must be able to feel. The wave of men who on those nights often and even without orders rushed behind the barriers through the fierce fire was an example of high and at the same time selfless human self-sacrifice. The picture of the tattered, smoking position which I passed immediately after the attack was imprinted on my memory with special force. The day's posts were already in place, but the trenches had not yet been put in order. The fallen were still lying on the posts, and immediately, as if grown out of these bodies, a new shift stood at the guns. A strange shock was caused by the sight of these groups. For a moment it was as if the difference between life and death disappeared. On the evening of July 3rd we returned to the front line. It was relatively quiet, but it was felt that something was in the air. In the ravine at the enemy's muffled but incessant hammering sounded as if metal was being worked. Often we intercepted secret talks intended for the English engineer officer in the front line about gas cylinders and blasting. From early morning until late dusk the British planes were on duty to create a dense air barrage in front of their rear. The daily rate of shelling of the trenches became noticeably greater than usual. There was a suspicious change of shelling targets, as if new batteries were being found. Still, on July 12th we were replaced we never got over anything unpleasant and remained in reserve at Monchi. On the evening of the 13th our dugouts in the gardens were shelled by the shelled's ten-inch gun, whose powerful shells were hurtling along a strictly receding trajectory. They burst with a truly terrifying rumble. At night we were awakened by heavy fire and gas attack. We were sitting in the dugout around the stove, with gas masks on, except for Vogel, who had not found his own. He was poking around in all the nooks and crannies, running back and forth while his gloating buddies reported that the smell of gas kept getting stronger. At last I gave him my spare breathing cartridge, and he squatted for an hour behind the smoky stove, clutching his nose and digging into his liner with a pitiful grimace. That same day I lost two men from my platoon. They were wounded in the village. Hasselin was shot through the arm, and Mashmeyer was shot through the neck by a shrapnel bullet. This night the attack did not follow. Nevertheless, the regiment suffered losses about 25 killed and many wounded. On the 15th and 17th we had to endure two more gas attacks. On the 17th we were replaced, and at Dushi we suffered two more heavy bombardments. One happened right in the middle of a council of officers at Major Jaroki's house, held in the fruit orchard. 
In spite of the danger, it was amusing to see how the Honourable Assembly, guarding their noses, fled in different directions, scrambling through the hedges, and instantly disappeared in all sorts of hiding places. In the garden of my apartment a shell killed a little eight-year-old girl digging in a garbage pit. On July 20th we returned to the position. On the 28th I agreed to go on patrol with Fenric Walgmuth, Ifleurs, Bartels and Berkner. In fact there was no other purpose but to wander around the barriers, to see if there was anything new on the no man's land, as life at the position had become dull again. Toward evening the officer of the 6th Company who had replaced me, Lieutenant Browns, came to visit me in my dugout with several bottles of good wine. About midnight we finished our revels, and I went out into the trench, where my companions were already gathered in the shadow of the crossbeam. Finding myself some good grenades, I climbed over the wire in a most cheerful mood, hearing break a leg sent by Browns after me. We soon crept up to the enemy's fortifications. Just before we did so we found a rather thick, well-insulated wire in the tall grass. I considered the find important, and instructed Walgemuth to cut a piece and bring it with him. While he was labouring over it with his cigar scissors for want of other tools, something rattled in the wire in front of us. Several Englishmen appeared, and began to work without noticing our huddled figures in the grass. Remembering the sad experience of the last reconnaissance, I exhaled faintly Walgemuth. A grenade there. Herr Lieutenant, let them work some more that's an order, Fenric. The spirit of the Prussian barracks was not slow to reverberate in this desert. With the fatal feeling of a man engaged in a hopeless adventure, I heard the dry creak of the fuse being pulled out and saw Walgemuth, to keep his head down, launch the grenade along the ground. It stuck in the shrubbery, halfway to the British, who seemed not to notice anything. A few moments of tense waiting. Krarak. Lightning illuminated the staggered figures. With a desperate cry of you are prisoners, we rushed like tigers into the white cloud. The disorderly action played out in a split second. I pointed my gun at someone's face, which glowed toward me out of the darkness like a pale mask. Some shadow flung itself against the wire fence with a shrill cry. It was the kind of wild shriek, like wara, but only a person who has seen a ghost can utter. To my left, Walgemith discharged his pistol. If Luther Bartels threw a grenade in confusion, with the first shot the clip popped out of the grip of my gun. I stood screaming in front of the Englishman, huddled in terror in the barbed wire, and pulled the trigger in vain. There was no shot, everything was like a soundless dream. In the trench in front of us, meanwhile they stirred. There were shouts. A machine gun rattled. We jumped back. Again I stood in the crater, pointing my pistol at the shadow that appeared right behind me. This time the pistol's failure was fortunate it was Berkner, whom I thought had long since run past. Farther on we carried on toward our trenches. At our barriers bullets whistled so that I had to jump into a shell crater filled with water and tangled with wire. Swinging on a mattress of barbed wire over the surface of the water, I heard the bullets buzzing as they flew over me like a powerful swarm of bees, while wire fragments and shrapnel chalked the bottom of the funnel. Half an hour later, when the fire had subsided, I climbed over our obstacles and jumped into the trench, cheered by my friends. Walgemuth and Bartels were already here. Half an hour later, Berkner also appeared. All were overjoyed at the happy outcome, regretting only that this time the coveted prisoner had eluded us. That the episode had had an exciting effect, I felt immediately as soon as gnashing my teeth, I climbed into the bunk in the dugout and, in spite of complete exhaustion, could not sleep. I knew well that feeling of extreme readiness, when it was as if a small electric bell was operating in the body. The next morning I could hardly walk, for I had a large wire cut across one knee, which already bore several memorable marks, and a fragment from a grenade thrown by Bartels lodged in the other. These brief sorties, when we had to hold ourselves firmly in hand, were a good means of hardening our character and breaking the monotony of trench life. The main thing for a soldier is not to be bored. On August 11th, a black riding horse roamed around the village of Berla Ork Boy, killed by some militiamen with three shots. The English officer from whom it had escaped could hardly have watched the scene calmly. During the night, Schultz, the gunner, was hit in the eye by a bullet fragment. There were more casualties in the village too, as the walls cut down by artillery fire offered less and less protection from the blind machine guns. 
we began digging trenches through the village and erecting new walls in dangerous places. Berries ripened in the feral gardens, which were all the more sweet because we had to eat them to the buzzing of bullets flying in. August 12th was a long-awaited day when I could go on vacation for the second time during the war. But I had hardly warmed up at home when I received a telegram return immediately, details at the Commandant's office in Canberra. Three hours later I was already on the train. On my way to the station three girls in light-coloured dresses, with tennis rackets under their arms, passed me by. A farewell greeting illuminated by the radiance of life, which lingered in my memory for a long time. On the 21st I was again in familiar surroundings. The roads were bustling with the departure of the 3rd and the arrival of the new division. The 1st Battalion was at the village of Accuse St. Main, its ruins we were to storm two years later. Bollock, whose days were also numbered, met me. He told me that the young men in my platoon had already asked twenty times if I had returned. This news excited me and filled me with confidence. As far as I could tell, I was not only numbered among the retinue by my superiors in the hot days ahead of us, but had personal assets as well. For the night I and eight other officers were placed in the attic of an empty house. In the evening we stayed awake for a long time, and for want of anything stronger, drank coffee prepared for us by two French women from a neighbouring house. We knew that this time we were going to fight a battle like nothing the history of the world had ever known. We were no less eager for victory than the troops who had crossed the frontier two years before, but we were perhaps more dangerous than them, as we were more skilful in battle. At the same time we were in the best, most cheerful spirits, and such words as retreat were unknown to us. He who saw the participants in this cheerful feast would have recognised that the position entrusted to them would only be taken if all its defenders were shot. And that is exactly what was destined to happen. On August 23, 1916, we were placed in trucks and set out for Le Mesnil. We already knew that we had to settle down in the legendary centre of the Battle of the Somme, the village of Guillemont, but despite this the mood was great. Jokes, with general laughter, were tossed from one car to another. During one stop, the chauffeur, while starting the car, shattered his thumb. The sight of this wound made me, always sensitive to such things, almost nauseous. All the more surprisingly, in the days that followed, I was able to bear the sight of the severe mutilation without any excitement. This is an example of how the holistic sense determines individual life experiences. As darkness fell, we marched out of Le Mesnil towards Say Say Zizel, where the battalion, encamped in a spacious meadow, removed their satchels and prepared their battle gear. Ahead rumbled the reverberations of artillery fire of unprecedented force. Thousands of glittering lightning bolts turned the western horizon into a continuous sea of raging fire. A continuous stream of wounded men with pale, gaunt faces returned, often unceremoniously pushed back into the ditch by guns rumbling past, or by columns of ammunition. A liaison of the Württemberg Regiment introduced himself to me to take my platoon to the famous town of Kombal, where we were temporarily to remain as a reserve. He was the first German soldier on whom I had ever seen a steel helmet, and he immediately seemed to me an inhabitant of some new, mysterious and harsh world. Sitting next to him in the ditch, I eagerly questioned him about his life at the position and heard a monotonous story about sitting in the craters all day long without any communication and approach routes, about incessant attacks, about fields strewn with corpses, about thirst that drove me to madness, about widespread death among the wounded, and much more framed by the cant of his steel helmet, his motionless face and his monotonous voice accompanied by the noise of the front made a terrible impression on us. In a short time the features of this messenger, who was to accompany us into the majesty of fire, had imprinted a brand that distinguished him from us in a way that could not be expressed in words. If you fall you stay down. No one can help you. No one knows if you'll come back alive. We're attacked every day, but we can't break through. It's clear to everyone that it's a fight to the death. There's nothing left in that voice but great male indifference. With such men one can go into battle. Along the broad street, in the moonlight a white ribbon running across the dark terrain, we walked towards the cannonade, the deafening roar of which became more and more exorbitant. Leave hope behind you. What made this landscape especially gloomy was the fact that all its roads were like glowing veins in the moonlight, and that not a single living soul could be seen on them. We walked along them like the shimmering paths of a night cemetery. 
Soon the first shells burst on our right and left. The speeches grew quieter and finally became completely silent. Everyone listened to the increasing howl of shells with that special tension which endows hearing with extreme acuteness. The passage of Fregicourt Farm, a small group of houses in front of the Comble Cemetery, was our first test. At this place the sack into which Comble had been taken was already tight. Anyone who wanted to enter or leave the city had to break through here, so the incessant fire of inordinate force, like beams of incendiary glass, was concentrated on this vital artery. The commander had already warned us of this notorious pass we marched rapidly over it, seeing everything around us crumbling with a crash. Above the ruins, as everywhere in the danger zones of the area, was the thick stench of decomposing corpses, for the fire was such that no one cared for the dead. It was a matter of life and death, and when I smelled this odour as I walked through the area, I was not surprised at all. It was not, however, a heavy and sweet-smelling breath that seemed repulsive at all indeed, it was exhilarating, mingled with the acrid vapours of the explosives, a state of rapturous insight that only the greatest proximity to death can induce. I made one observation here, and in the whole war perhaps only in this battle there is a kind of fear that is as mesmerising as uncharted ground. Thus, in these moments I felt not fear, but an uplifting and almost demonic lightness I was also attacked by sudden fits of laughter, which nothing could not take away. Comble as far as could be seen in the pitch darkness, was no longer a village, but a mere skeleton of one, the firewood lying haphazardly between the ruins and the household utensils thrown out on the road told that the destruction had been recent, overcoming the untold mountains of garbage with the rapidity of another round of shrapnel. We reached our apartment, a large, bullet-riddled house, where I was lodged with three of the troops the other two were in the cellar of the ruined house opposite. At four o'clock we were lifted from our beds, which were made up of the wreckage of beds and sent to get steel helmets. At the same time we found a sack of coffee beans in the cellar alcove, a discovery which had the effect of making coffee diligently. After breakfast I looked around a bit. In a short time, by the efforts of heavy artillery, a peaceful stage town had been turned into a nightmare scene. Whole houses had been dented into the ground or torn apart from the inside by direct hits so that the rooms and their furnishings floated above the chaos like theatre sets. Some of the ruins reeked of corpse stench, for the first surprise attack had taken the inhabitants by surprise, burying many beneath the ruins before they could escape. At one doorstep lay a small dead girl, sprawled in a pool of blood. The area in front of the ruined church opposite the entrance to the catacombs, an ancient cavernous corridor with blasted niches where almost all the headquarters of the fighting groups were crammed together, was the worst hit. It was said that at the very beginning of the raids the inhabitants used pickaxes to clear the bricked-up entrance, which was concealed from the Germans throughout the occupation. Only narrow paths remained of the streets snaking through them were powerful piles of beams and masonry. Untold quantities of fruit and vegetables had perished in the ruined gardens, after lunch, which we boiled from the inviolable supplies we had in abundance, and which, as usual, ended with strong coffee, I settled down in an armchair to rest. From the letters scattered about I ascertained that the house belonged to Lesage, the proprietor of the brewery. The room was filled with open cabinets and dressers, an overturned wash basin, a sewing machine, and a baby stroller. Broken paintings and mirrors hung on the walls. On the floor, in a disorderly heap of a metre high, were boxes, lingerie, corsets, books, newspapers, night tables, shards, bottles, notes, chair legs, skirts, coats, lamps, curtains, window sills, dawn from their hinges, lace, photographs, oil paintings, albums, broken chests, ladies' hats, and flower pots, and wallpaper torn to shreds. Through the shattered windows one could see the shell-torn quadrangle of the deserted square, littered with the branches of mangled linden trees. This chaos of impressions was supplemented by the incessant artillery fire that raged around the place. From time to time the noise was interrupted by the tremendous burst of a fifteen-inch shell. Shrapnel clouds flew over Comble, slamming against tree branches or falling on the few roofs that still survived, tearing off slate sheets. In the afternoon the fire reached such an incredible intensity that there was a monstrous rumbling in the ears, which swallowed up all other sounds. From seven o'clock onward the square, and the houses around it were bombarded every half minute with six-inch shells. Among them were many unexploded ones, the short, unpleasant blows of which shook the house to its very foundations. 
All this time we sat in silk upholstered chairs around the table, resting our heads on our hands and counting the minutes between the explosions. The witticisms became less and less frequent, and at last the most dashing of us were silent. At eight o'clock, after two direct hits, a neighbouring house collapsed, the collapse blew up a mighty cloud of dust. Between nine and ten o'clock the fire raged in a wild, frenzied fury. The earth shook the sky seemed a gigantic boiling cauldron. Hundreds of heavy batteries rumbled around Comble and in it itself, indiscriminate shells with hissing and howling passed over our heads. Everything was shrouded in a thick smoke, through which the colourful rockets the heralds of trouble shone out. My head and ears hurt so badly that we could only exchange jerky, growl-like phrases. Our ability to think logically and our dignity seemed to have deserted us. A sense of the inevitable and inescapable rose up before us like an encounter with a bursting element. One of the non-commissioned officers of the 3rd platoon went into a raving frenzy. At ten o'clock this infernal carnival began to subside and change to a steady hurricane fire, in which, however, still drowned single shots. At eleven a liaison came running in and brought orders to lead the platoons into the church square. Then we joined with two other platoons to move into position. A fourth platoon, commanded by Lieutenant Sievers, was equipped to deliver food. His men surrounded us as we hastily echoed each other and gathered in a dangerous place and supplied us with bread, tobacco and canned meat. Sievers forced a whole pot of butter on me, shook my hand in farewell and wished me all the best. Then we marched out, lining up at each other's necks. Each of us had an order to be equal to the one in front of us. Even when leaving the village, our commander noticed that he had gotten lost. In spite of heavy shrapnel fire, we were forced to return. Then by short runs we moved along the white strip, a guiding thread laid across the field and broken by explosions into small segments, often stopped in the most inopportune places if the commander lost the right direction. In addition, in order not to lose sight of each other, it was forbidden to lie down. Nevertheless, the first and third platoon suddenly disappeared. Let's go. Both units were stuck in a hollow that was being severely shelled. Get down. The repulsive, intrusive odour left no doubt that the passage of this place had cost more than one victim. After a deadly run we got into the second hollow where the commander's dugout was hidden, lost our way, and turned back in a depressed state of mind. About five metres away from Lieutenant Vogel and me, a medium-caliber shell hit the rear embankment and exploded with a deafening rumble, throwing us huge lumps of earth, showering us with waves of mortal terror. At last the commander found the road, having determined the direction by the most conspicuous cluster of corpses. One of the dead was lying on a chalky slope with his arms spread out like a cross what imagination could have invented a road sign more suitable for such a landscape. Go, go. The men were exhausted from running, but we encouraged them with harsh shouts, wringing the last strength from their weary bodies. The wounded, crying in vain for help, fell left and right into shell craters. Further on, keeping an eye on the one in front, they waded through a knee-deep trench formed by a chain of huge funnels in which the dead lay one by one. Reluctantly their feet tread on the soft, supple bodies, whose form was hidden from view by the darkness. The wounded man who had run out into the road was crushed by the boots of those who were marching forward. And then there was that sweet odour. My liaison, little Schmidt, my constant companion on the dangerous paths, began to stagger. I snatched the rifle from his hands, and the good fellow even at that moment tried to resist out of politeness. At last we reached the front line, which was densely occupied by the men lurking in the holes when they learned that the shift had arrived, their colourless voices trembled with joy. The Bavarian field flabelle, after saying a few words, handed me the plot and the rocket launcher. My platoon's plot formed the right wing of the regimental position and consisted of a flat ravine turned by shells into a gully which, a few hundred metres to the left of Guillemont and a little less to the right of Bois de Tron, cut into open country. We were separated from our right neighbour, the 76th Infantry Regiment, by an unoccupied space in which, because of the inordinately brutal fire, no one could be in. The Bavarian field flabelle suddenly disappeared without a trace, and I was left all alone, rocket launcher in hand, in the midst of an eerie, crater-riddled terrain that was ominously and mysteriously concealed by vapours of fog drifting over the ground. Behind me I heard a muffled, 
unpleasant noise with surprising sobriety, I determined that it came from a huge decomposing corpse. As I did not know even approximately where the enemy was, I went to my men and told them not to lose their alertness for a moment. No one slept I spent the night with Paulike and the two liaisons in a foxhole, the space of which did not exceed one cubic metre. When dawn broke, the unfamiliar terrain gradually came into view. The hollow was nothing but a series of huge craters filled with shreds of uniforms, weapons and dead men the surrounding countryside, as far as the eye could see, was riddled with heavy shells. In vain the eyes tried to find a single stalk of wretchedness. The torn-up battlefield was a ghastly sight. Among the living fighters lay the dead. Excavating the foxholes we found that they were arranged in layers on top of each other. Companies, standing shoulder to shoulder in the hurricane fire, swung one after another, the corpses were covered with earth thrown by shells, and a new shift immediately took the place of the dead. Now it was our turn. The gully and the field behind it were strewn with Germans, the front field with Englishmen. Arms, legs and heads were sticking out of the embankment's torn limbs and bodies, lay in front of our dens to hide the disfigured faces, overcoats or raincoats were thrown over some of them. In spite of the heat, no one thought of committing them to the ground. The village of Guillemont seemed to have vanished without a trace, only a whitish spot in the rugged field marked the spot where the chalk stone of the houses had been ground to dust. Directly in front of us, crumpled like a child's toy, was the Guillemont station, and far beyond it the woods of Delville turned to splinters. It was barely daylight when an English pilot came and circled over us in a swooping flight, so that we all scattered to our dens and hid there. The scout's keen eye did see us, for soon up above came the howl of a heavy, muffled siren, following each other at short intervals. They were like the calls of a fairy tale creature hovering ominously over the desert. After a while the battery received the signals. The heavy shells, one after another, whistling along the spurred trajectory, burst with incredible fury. We stood idly in our shelters, occasionally lighting a cigar and flicking it away again, quite aware that we might be covered with earth every minute. Schmidt's uniform sleeve was torn by a large piece of shrapnel. At the third blow the occupant of a neighbouring hole was covered with a powerful hit. We dug him up at once, nevertheless the mass of earth so compressed him that he almost suffocated, his face shriveled up and looking like a dead man's mask. It was Sergeant Simon. Misfortune had made him prudent as the daylight men strutted about in full view of the pilots. From the opening of his hole, covered with a tarpaulin, a brusque voice was heard, and a threatening fist stuck out. At three o'clock in the afternoon my sentries appeared from the left flank, announcing that they could hold on no longer, as their holes had been smashed. I had to muster all my resolution to send them to their posts again. For I, being in the most dangerous place, possessed the highest authority imaginable. About ten o'clock in the evening a firestorm began on the left flank of the regiment, which in twenty minutes spread over us. In a short time we were covered with a continuous cloud of dust and smoke, but most of the hits came in the area either in front of or behind the trench, if our unfurled hollow could be dignified by that name. As the storm raged around us, I walked around my platoon's section. The men, stone still and with rifles drawn, stood at the front slope of the hollow and stared ahead without a break. Now and then, in the flash of a flare, I saw a row of helmets and rifles gleaming, and I was filled with a sense of pride that I was in command of a handful of men who could be destroyed but could not be defeated. At such moments the human spirit triumphs over the overbearing manifestations of the material world, and the weak body, hardened by will, is ready to resist the most terrible thunderstorms. In the next platoon on the left, Fieldful Bell X, the hapless rat catcher from Monchi, about to launch a white light rocket, missed, and the red barrage, picked up by all the flanks, rose to the sky with a hiss. Our artillery immediately opened fire in a way that was a sight to behold. Out of the air with a howl fell one mine after another and crashed in front of us so that the fragments flew sparks. A mixture of dust, asphyxiating gases, and the stinking vapour of corpses raised by the blast wave rose from the funnels in a roiling whirlwind. After this orgy of annihilation the fire flowed in its usual course. The convulsive firing of a single man set in motion the whole mighty military manoeuvre was unlucky once more that same night. While loading his pistol, he put a bullet in his shin and was taken to the sanitary station with severe burns. The next day it rained heavily, 
which was not without its pleasantness to us, for the dust had settled, the dry feeling in the mouth was no longer so distressing, and the large blue-black flies which had accumulated in huge flakes like dark velvet cushions in sunny places disappeared, having dispersed. For nearly the whole day I sat at the bottom of my hole, smoking, and in spite of my surroundings, eating with great appetite. The next morning the rifleman of my platoon, Nicky, received a rifle wound in the chest, which also hit his spine, so that his legs were taken away. When I went to check on him, he was lying perfectly still in his hole. In the evening he was dragged through artillery fire, and as the stretcher bearers ran for cover, he also received a broken leg. At the dressing station he passed away. In the afternoon a soldier of my platoon called out to me and suggested that, throwing my rifle over the severed leg of an Englishman, I should take the area in front of the Guillemont station in the crosshairs. Hundreds of Englishmen were hurriedly making their way across the flat trench, paying no attention to the weak rifle fire which I immediately directed at them. The scene was momentous, it showed the inequality of the means at our disposal. Had we ventured to do the same, our units would have been annihilated in a few minutes. While not a single balloon was seen on our side, they had more than thirty at a time, forming a large, yellow glowing cluster of grapes they kept a close watch on every moving target that appeared on the broken ground, in order to send a goodly portion of iron at once. In the evening a large piece of shrapnel buzzing struck me in the stomach region fortunately, it had already completed its trajectory, and striking hard against the buckle of my belt, fell to the ground. This shocked me so much that only the anxious cries of my companions, holding out their flasks to me, reminded me of the danger. It had hardly begun to dusk when two English food carriers, who had evidently lost their way, appeared in front of the first platoon station. They approached complacently one held a round can of food, the other had an oblong cauldron of tea in his hand. Both were shot at close range, the torso of one of them was thrown back into the gully, and his legs were left lying on the embankment. They were reluctant to take prisoners, how can you drag them through the barrage when you can hardly manage it yourself? It was at about one o'clock in the morning I was roused from a heavy sleep by Schmidt. Excited, I jumped up and grabbed my gun. The shift came in. We handed her everything we needed and left this devilish place as quickly as possible. As soon as we stepped into the flat trench we were immediately hit by the first shrapnel fire. A bullet pierced my guide's wrist, and blood spurted from it. He staggered backward and leaned sideways. I grabbed him by the arm, forced him to stand up despite his groans, and only in the sanitary dugout near the commander's adit I handed him over. In both gorges the situation was acute. We could hardly catch our breath. The worst place was the valley where we got to, and where shrapnel and light shells were tearing without end. Bang. Bang. We. A new line. I caught my breath, for in a split second I could tell from that howl, which was becoming more and more distinct, that the deflected trajectory of the shell was going to end with me. Just then, near my foot, a heavy projectile whirred, kicking up soft clods of clay. And it was the one that didn't explode. The local environment provided a great opportunity to raise the officer's authority. Everywhere, through the gloom and fire, rushed troops, either on their way to the shift or already defended it, partly out of the way, groaning with excitement and fatigue in the midst of it all there were shouts, orders and monotonously repeated, long cries for help from the wounded forgotten in the craters. I explained the way to those who were lost in this frantic rush, pulled men out of holes, threatened those who would not rise, shouted my name incessantly to draw them all to me, and miraculously got my platoon back to Comble. From Comble, passing by Say and Gouvernum and Fermi, we were to proceed to the Enui Forest and camp there. It was only now that our fatigue made itself felt. We wandered along the road, staring dully at the ground, occasionally pushed back by cars and ammunition columns. In the heat of painful irritability I convinced myself that the rumbling cars were rushing so close to the edge out of spite for us, and more than once I caught my hand grasping for my holster. After the march we pitched our tents, and only then threw ourselves on the hard ground. While we stood in this forest, the rain kept pouring down like a bucket. The straw dragged into the tents began to rot, and many fell ill. We five company commanders did not suffer much from the dampness, sitting in the evenings on our suitcases around the empty bottles that had come from nowhere. Red wine in this case is an indispensable medicine. On one such evening, the guards attacked the village of Morpa in a retaliatory assault. 
While the two artilleries fiercely fought each other over a long space, a terrible thunderstorm broke out, and like Homer's battle between men and gods, the rebellious earth competed with the rebellious sky. Three days later we moved again to Combal, where I and my platoon occupied four small cellars. These cellars were built of chalk blocks and had the rounded shape of narrow, elongated barrels they promised safe shelter. Apparently they had once been owned by a winemaker, at least that was how I explained to myself the fact that they were adorned with small, hollowed-out fireplaces in the wall. I appointed a sentry, and we stretched out on a pile of mattresses brought here by our predecessors. The first day was comparatively quiet, and I had an opportunity of wandering through the deserted gardens and plundering the trellises hung with excellent peaches. Wandering about, I came upon a house enclosed by a high fence, and belonging apparently to a lover of beautiful antiques. In the rooms a collection of elaborately painted plates, revealing the taste of a Norman, and etchings were hung on the walls, along the walls, along the walls were sprinklers and wooden sculptures of saints. Large cabinets were cluttered with antique porcelain, and miniature volumes in leather bindings lay on the floor, among them a rare old edition of Don Quixote. And all these treasures were doomed to decay. I would have liked to take something as a souvenir, but I would have looked like Robinson with a bar of gold here, these things were worthless. It was the way in which whole rolls of the best silks died in some manufactory, abandoned to their fate. One thought of the blazing lintel at Fregicourt Fermi, which kept the place shut up, and immediately all new baggage became superfluous. When I reached my lodgings, my boys, who had returned from a similar walk in the local gardens, had made a soup of vegetables, tinned meat, potatoes, peas, carrots, artichokes and assorted greens, in which a spoon could safely stand. While we were eating, a shell flew into the house, and three more exploded nearby, after which we were left alone. From the over-excess of impressions our senses were greatly dulled. Something bloody had already happened in the house, for in the middle room on a pile of garbage stood a crudely made cross, with a whole list of names carved in wood. The next day I brought from the collector's house a bundle of illustrated supplements to the petite journal I settled down in the surviving room, kindled a fireplace with a piece of furniture, and began to read by the light of the fire. Every now and then I had to shake my head, for I had come across issues published at the time of the Fashoda incident. While I was reading, four shells went off at regular intervals near our house. At about seven o'clock I turned the last page and headed for the room in front of the cellar entrance, where my men were cooking dinner on a small stove. Hardly had I appeared, there was a sharp crack in front of the door of the house, and at the same instant I felt a violent kick in my left shin. With the old soldier's cry I've been shot I rolled down the cellar steps without letting go of my pipe. Quickly the light was turned on, and the matter was investigated. As always in such cases I, looking up at the ceiling, for it was not pleasant to look myself, listened first to the report. There was a jagged hole gaping through the wrapper, from which a thin trickle of blood gushed out. On the other side protruded the round thickening of a shrapnel bullet lodged under the skin. It wasn't hard to make a diagnosis a typical wound that would ensure a return home, not too light but not too heavy. It was a last chance to be in Germany. The hit was somehow very insidious, because the shrapnel exploded on the other side of the brick wall that wrapped around our house. The shell pierced a round window in it, in front of which stood a tub of oleander. Thus first the bullet intended for me flew into the hole drilled by the shell, then breaking through the oleander leaves, crossed the yard, broke through the door, and having got into the hay, of all the feet standing there, chose mine. It was exactly a quarter past eight, Having hastily applied a bandage, my boys carried me across the street, incessantly shelled, into the catacombs and immediately put me on the operating table. While Lieutenant Vettier, who had rushed in, held my head, the chief staff doctor extracted the bullet with knife and scissors, congratulating me at the end, for the lead had lodged right between the tibia and fibula without hitting them himself. Habent sua fata libelli et bali, proclaimed the old corpse student, handing me over to the orderly for bandaging. Even before dusk, while I was lying like this on a stretcher in one of the catacomb niches, I was visited by my own people to say goodbye. Colonel von Oppen, dear to my heart, came in for a short time. In the evening, together with the other wounded, I was carried to the exit of the village and loaded into an ambulance. Disregarding the cries of the inhabitants, the driver, jumping over craters and other obstacles, 
raced along the highway, on which shells were still hitting hard in the vicinity of Fregicourt Furman, and then his car was replaced by another, which took us to the church of the village of Fen. The change of cars took place deep in the night near a lonely group of houses, where the doctor checked our bandages and determined where to direct us next. Through my budding fever, I discerned a still young man, completely grey-haired, who tended to our wounds with amazing care. Fen's church was filled with hundreds of wounded. The Sister of Mercy told me that more than 30,000 had passed through the place in recent weeks. Compared to such numbers, I, with my miserable wound, seemed to myself to be nothing at all. From Fen, with four other officers, I was transferred to a small infirmary in one of the burger houses of Canton. When we were unloaded, the windows of all the houses rattled it was the very hour when the English had thrown the whole force of their artillery into the assault on Guillemont. As my neighbour was being carried out, I heard one of those lifeless voices which are not forgotten. Please hurry to the doctor, I am very ill. I have gas phlegmon. It was the word for the most dangerous form of blood poisoning complicating a wound. It ruined life. I was carried into a ward where twelve beds were so closely pressed together that it looked as if the room were filled with nothing but snow-white pillows. Most of the wounds were severe, and a huddle reigned, in which I, being delirious, took some unreal part. Soon after my appearance, a young fellow with a turban-like bandage on his head jumped up from his bed, as if about to make a speech. I expected some special curiosity, when he fell as suddenly as he had risen. His bed, in general mournful silence, was rolled out through a small, dark door. My neighbour was an officer saper while in a trench, he stepped on an explosive checker, and it spat a sharp tongue of flame at him, as from a burner. A transparent gauze cap was put on his mangled leg. He was in a good mood, however, and was glad that he had found in me an attentive listener. To my left lay a very young Fenric, who had been fed with red wine and egg yolk he was in the extreme degree of dystrophy imaginable. When his sister made his bed, she lifted him up like a feather every bone in the human body, showed through under his skin. One night the nurse asked him if he would like to write to his parents, and I understood what that meant indeed. That very night, too, his bed was taken through a dark door into the dead room. The very next day I was on an ambulance train taking me to Jera, where excellent care was prepared for me in the garrison infirmary. Exactly a week later, one evening I sneaked out of there, but kept looking around for fear of being seen by the chief physician. Here I subscribed to a war loan of 3,000 marks all I owned never to see them again. While I held the bills in my hands, a small rocket, detached from a signal fire inadvertently let off, flew at them a spectacle evidently worth at least a million. Let us return once more to that dreadful hollow to admire the last act with which such dramas end. Here is what the few survivors of the wounded and among them my liaison Otto Schmidt. After I was wounded, my deputy field Heisterman took command of the platoon and in a few minutes brought the squad to the cratered area of Guillemont. Except for a few men wounded on the march and returned to Comble as best they could, the team disappeared without a trace in the fiery labyrinths of battle. The platoon, having taken a shift, again settled down in the familiar foxholes. The gap on the right flank thanks to the continuous fire on the destruction expanded so much that it became invisible. On the left flank also appeared holes, so that the position was completely like an island, girdled by powerful streams of fire. Of similarly large and small islands, gradually merging into each other, the whole sight in the broad sense of the word consisted. Sturm ran into a net whose loops had become too wide to catch him. Thus, in growing anxiety, the night passed. Toward morning a two-man patrol of the 76th Regiment appeared, sneaking along with incredible effort. He immediately disappeared into the sea of fire, and with him the last communication with the outside world disappeared. The fire swept more and more furiously over the right flank and gradually widened the gap, tearing out of the line one nest of resistance after another. About six o'clock in the morning, Schmidt, having got ready for breakfast, went to fetch a cauldron which he kept in front of the entrance to the old burrow, but could only find a flattened, pierced piece of aluminum. Soon the shelling resumed and began to take on a fierce force that was a sure sign of a near assault. Airplanes appeared and, like kites descending on prey, began circling over the very ground. Eisterman and Schmidt, the only inhabitants of the tiny earthen cave that had so far survived by some miracle, realised that the moment had come to prepare for battle. 
When they emerged into a hollow filled with smoke and dust, they found themselves in the midst of a perfect desert. During the night the fire had raised to the ground the last pathetic shelters that separated them from their right flank, and those inside had been buried under masses of collapsed earth. But even on their left hand the edge of the gully was completely denuded. The remnants of the garrison, including the machine gun crew, had taken refuge in a narrow dugout, covered only with boards and a thin layer of earth, with two passages dug into the rear embankment about the middle of the hollow. Into this last refuge and rushed Heisterman and Schmidt, but on their way there the fieldfelder, who had just had a birthday that day, disappeared. He stayed around the corner, never to reappear. The only man who came into the dugout from the right flank was a lieutenant with a bandaged face. Suddenly he tore off his bandage, showering men and weapons with a stream of blood, and lay down on the ground to die. All this time the power of the fire was continually increasing in the crowded dugout, where not a word had been spoken for a long time. A direct hit was expected at every moment. Farther down the left flank a few more men of the 3rd platoon clung to their funnels, while the whole position on the right, starting from the former gap, which had long since grown to an unbridgeable abyss, was being thrashed. These men were evidently the first to see the British reconnaissance parties coming forward in the wake of the last crushing fire stroke. At any rate, the garrison had been warned of the approach of the enemy by shouts from their left. Schmidt, who had come to the dugout last and was therefore closest to the exit, was the first to enter the ravine. He came under the shrapnel fire of an exploded shell. Through the dissipating cloud he saw several lurking figures in khaki on the right, just in the place of the former burrow, which had been our reliable defence. At the same instant the enemy broke into the left flank of the position in dense ranks, but what was happening on the other side of the front embankment could not be seen from the depths of the gully. In this truly desperate situation the last inhabitants of the dugout, and above all field for Bolsivers, with his surviving machine gun and his team, jumped out. In a matter of seconds the gun was set up at the bottom of the ravine and pointed at the enemy. As soon as the gunner, having put his hand on the cartridge belt, prepared to press the charging handle, English grenades flew from behind the front embankment. Both gunners collapsed near their machine guns before they could fire. Anyone who jumped out of the dugout was immediately met by rifle shots, so that in a few moments both entrances were surrounded by a wide ring of dead bodies. The first grenade volley also fell Schmidt to the ground. One piece of shrapnel struck him in the head, and three fingers were torn off by others. He remained lying with his face pressed into the ground near the dugout, which for a long time attracted intense rifle and machine gun fire. At last all was quiet the British had taken possession of this part of the position as well. Schmidt, perhaps the last living soul in the whole gorge, heard footsteps heralding the approach of the invader. Immediately above the very ground came the boom of rifle shots and the explosions of hand grenades used to clear the dugout. Nevertheless, towards evening a few more survivors, who had been hiding in a well-protected corner, came out of it. They formed a group of the few prisoners who had fallen into the hands of the assaulting squads. The English orderlies gathered them up and carried them away. Comble soon fell too, after the sack at Fregicourt Firm had been tightened. Its last defenders, who had been sitting in the catacombs during the shelling, were annihilated in the battle for the church ruins. There was then a lull in the area until we retook it in the spring of 1918.